You are the uh, chief data scientist at Mashable. I am indeed. And our first question is about velocity. Uh, we've been informed uh, by the capacity and feature set of velocity, uh, which uses predictive analysis to inform content creation. Uh, but recently we found out that you've got another software called Kilogram. Uh, would you like to tell a bit about Kilogram? Sure, absolutely. So, actually, Kilogram and Velocity work hand in hand. Kilogram, you can think of Velocity as a way of trying to understand uh, where broad individual trends are going to happen. For Kilogram, what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand how our particular audience tends to respond to content. At the core of Kilogram is an understanding of what happens when you read a Mashable article and you happen to share it with me. And if you multiply that hundreds of, the, hundreds of thousands of times, what you get are communities of sharing patterns. Uh, and that tells you a lot about how our audience tends to consume content. And it allows us to make informed choices about how we distribute our content to our, to, to our audience. Essentially, it lays bare the structure of our audience in a way that uh, without a tool like Kilogram, we really don't have access to. We believe that, uh, what uh, Jeffrey Zadman says, uh, content precedes design. Um, given the fact that you've been working quite a lot on the content, uh, what kind of tools uh, do you use to uh, gather information about uh, your users, your readers' uh, footprints? Yeah, it's a, a really great question. So you started off by asking me about Kilogram, and that is, frankly, the primary way in which we establish this kind of uh, footprint. Because through Kilogram, we essentially know everything that we're likely going to know as a publisher about what a, a, a user likes. We know what they've seen in the past. We know what they're, they're, they're viewing right now. We also know who they've shared their content to and whose shares they've arrived on. Um, obviously, we don't know anything privacy infringing information, but that set of information that I just described is already sufficient to build out a pretty detailed profile of a of, of a user beyond kilogram though you know there are some aggregate analyses that we do for which heat maps are particularly important also we look at uh, what I would call churn curves so curves that tell us the the likelihood that somebody who's been a, a who's been an infrequent reader of Mashable content will suddenly become a frequent uh, viewer of, of Mashable content or vice versa a, somebody who's who has been a frequent viewer of Mashable content will for whatever reason, fall out of uh, uh, of their regular habit of reading our content. So, that this is a these kinds of curves give a good indication of the overall bulk flow of of I guess brand loyalty that we're seeing. How does your educational background uh, affect what you do in uh, do at Mashable? It's a great question. So. My background uh, is as a theoretical physicist. Um, quite frankly, it informs everything that I do at Mashable. I, many data scientists come from a background of, uh, of physics, but many come from computer science or uh, sometimes mathematics as well. From my perspective, a lot of the problems that we work on basically amount to a statistical mechanics problem, a, a sub-branch of uh, physics that I know very well. Uh, in particular, if we take kilogram as a concrete example, that, from my mathematical perspective, really is a, a problem of diffusion on a, essentially a random graph. Um, being a physicist has been incredibly helpful in being able to take, take problems whose business predicates were relatively new to me, certainly at the start of my, my, my tenure at Mashable, and being able to actually derive an algorithmic, algorithmic solution. Um, this is sort of the physicist bread and butter, and uh, frankly, uh, media has offered me some of the most interesting problems that I've worked on. What do you think, or how do you think, the artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning will uh, affect what you do at Mashable? My hope is that it will have a profound impact on what we do. I say that because I think, and I, I tried to allude to this in, the, in the, my, my uh, presentation on the main stage, artificial intelligence is the first 
set of, of tools that I know that's able to abstract from content a notion of aesthetics and a notion of style. It's really, really hard to talk about what makes content good and interesting to a viewer without the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, you can do a lot of interesting modeling around preferences, but when it actually comes time to say, this is interesting to my audience because of this, artificial intelligence offers the first real, what I would call a representation of a content that allows us to do really serious quantitative things. We see this most solidly with computer vision where you can actually talk about the style that an image has. Almost certainly some notion of style, maybe not the most facile ones that come out of, uh, directly out of current uh, uh, neural networks, but some notion of style ha is, is probably the useful feature that determines whether on site somebody sees an image and they're like, oh, I want to read that article because of this image, right? We all have a primitive response to, to the words in a headline and the, the objects and colors we see in an image. And artificial intelligence actually begins to peel away at those features in a way that actually is useful. Um, I don't know of any other tool set that can do that. Um, what would you uh, suggest? What would uh, be the one and only suggestion to uh, young professionals who um, uh, wishes to create change uh, working in the areas of design, software, and technology? Oh. You know, it's interesting. You asked about my educational background. And one of the things that, given my background, one of the things that uh, was, I think, very new to me and the hardest to learn at the outset of my, my, my time in media was how thoroughly and deeply you have to think about your end user and how easy it is to craft a system, craft, design a system based on principles that are independent of a user experience. It's, it's wrong, 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 wrong. The first thing and the thing that you have to do at almost every stage of designing a product or frankly designing an algorithm is to consider ultimately the actions and preferences of the, the, the end user. So I, it's, a, it's a lesson I have to learn on a regular basis and I would, I, would, I would suggest for anyone entering a design consideration to consider that inculcating themselves very early the, the primacy of, of user, user preference and user experience. So. Thank you so much for joining us. My it was pleasure. a pleasure Thank you for to having have me. you on Shared Problem. Such a pleasure. Thank you.